So, yes, there's, there's a long debate now in the market whether this was, you know, Corona's last hurrah. Is this the start of tightening? I guess my question to you is, is an orderly retreat from the BOJ possible? Oh, uh, yes, it is. Um, but I guess they have to be very, very conscious of the holders of their debt, um, the impact that that can have on global markets and, I guess, being almost a good central bank citizen of the world. Um, I agree with your previous um, commentator, Geroy, on, on the timing. I think it, this, this time of the year uh, was a good time because you got maximum effect. And as I noted in a note in a piece yesterday, it was 33 years ago, or almost 33 years ago to the day, it was Christmas Day of 1989 when they unexpectedly hike and really set the market off. Um, when you think about what they've got to do to exit, um, I, I think the exit takes quite a long time. They've got everything, including the kitchen sink, in their portfolio. So a lot of this stuff will take a long, long time to mature. But they needed to probably be realistic in that whole idea of central bankers, as you said in the intro, being a little bit more transparent with what their intentions are. If he did it early next year, or even as late as April when he's supposed to be leaving, then the market might actually see that as a bit of a lack of confidence or lack of credibility at the time. So starting early, I think, is the beginning of a process of this unwind. Martin, sure, uh, 1989, and when they raised rates Christmas Day, that presaged deflation, years of deflation, some have argued. I mean, this is not of that magnitude, naturally, but uh, he's uh, also, no. in some ways, boxed in, because if he does not see significant wage growth, this policy is not going to work. Uh, no, and, and three arrows uh, was the great hope of, what, uh, seven or eight, ten, ten years ago, I think, um, which didn't work either. Uh, so I'm not sure that you can really change a lot of the real structural issues in Japan, uh, such as demographics. But, um, you know, maybe these things are a way of... You know, that, and when, when that was done, and it was encouraging investors, as it's called, Mrs Watanabe, to go offshore, earn high income offshore, bring it back home and spend it. Kind of worked for a little bit, but, um, you know, a lot of these things tend to fizzle out, but you've got to try something. If you sit there, uh, you, you know, you're going to probably die wondering. And, and, of course, a lot of questions about, you know, these repatriated flows now. Where are we likely going to see the most losses if any, um, and maybe where you're seeing Treasury yields, JGB yields are going to go? Sure. So earlier this year, uh, well, as every, most people would know, in April of every year, you get a, um, a snapshot of what the life insurance companies intend to do for their year ahead. And in March of this year, before that, my view was as central banks start to lift their policy rates, the FX hedging costs for a Japanese investor of global bonds is going to mean it just doesn't make sense for them to go offshore there. They're just not attaining enough yield. The forward curve is very, very steep. So it was better for Japan, as I wrote at the time, to stay at home. Now you've got a 10-year JGB close enough to 50 and possibly even rising from here. And when you look at uh, the capital flow in markets like the US, where they own a trillion dollars worth of bonds and have been selling this year, Australia, where they own several hundred million and have been selling this year, a billion, been selling this year. I think for Japan, it's just not worth them going offshore. Now, they've had regulators over the years say, oh, you've got to be very wary of the currency implications of your investments. Don't go lose money. That was particularly of the banks, but it's equally true of the lifers. I think going forward, Japan will continue to stay at home because the slope of the yield curve in Japan is so steep and everything hedged back is so low because of where other mm. central banks have got their policy rate that it behooves you as, as a Mrs Watanabe or as a Japanese investor to stay at home, yeah. at least in the fixed income market. And the move from the yen yesterday to really strengthen is just an underscoring of how risky it can be if you're not FX hedged. So I say they, they stay at home again. I'd say this means there is a shift higher in the longer ends of curves, and particularly there I'd say your 10-year through to 30-year parts of the curve because Japan is probably not turning up. I think that's going to matter a lot for Western... Yeah. Yes, sorry. 
Uh, Martin, just get your view on uh, the yen. I mean, it, ultimately, I mean, hedging costs aside, we still have the same yield kind of differentials there, which have been blamed for what was happening with the yen falling back. So is this a uh, currency yep. on a picnic? Uh, look, the yen can... Uh, the yen can strengthen on the idea of all, uh, on the on any FX flow that is hedged. That will that will be beneficial for the yen. The interest rate differential is not going to change anytime soon. Although what you'd expect to see is that, say, in the case of the Fed, eventually they'll stop. Eventually they'll cut rates as they get towards a recession, and so that differential starts to narrow. The market will be forward looking on that and strengthen the yen. On the crosses, I think that's where the yen actually can really see some performance. OK, can you walk us through some of your forecasts then for yen now? How are you adjusting? What's the cleanest way to trade this? Uh, I, for me, it's Aussie yen, being short Aussie yen. And right. I would look for that to, right. get, to <laughs> get down to a sort of 80 to 75. It's a, it's a highly okay, traded yeah. pair, and it's, um, it's one where uh, I think um, there's been a lot of capital flow there, and I think that that's going to continue to reverse.